everyone doing? It's always good when we have Olympic champions on, I think. I'm super excited. And four gold medals. Oh, thank you. Four gold medals. Sonia Richard Ross, four gold medals. Amazing. So, uh, by the way, you do look amazing. Thank you. And I know um, no one even knew when you came in that you are, is it seven months seven pregnant? Seven months, yes. So, congratulations. So, wow. <laughs> How has it been? Uh, my wife and I had kids nine months ago. Nice, it's congratulations. Been amazing, but a lot of work. Yes. Uh, but how has the pregnancy been for you so far? It's been so good. I, if my belly wasn't growing, I wouldn't even know I was pregnant. I've had no nausea, no morning sickness, no cravings. I'm doing like a real champ. There's a lot of women out there really upset at you right I now. I know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so have there been any, like, um, well, first of all, your husband is an NFL champion. Yes. Have you guys talked about, okay, so this kid's probably maybe going to be athletic. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> have you guys talked about, well, we want him to do track and field or You know, my husband or... and I have both been saying, you know, oh, we don't care, whatever he wants. But I think secretly I want him to do track and he wants him to do football for sure. <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot of pressure yeah. having the two of you as parents. I know, and we've been talking about that. My husband's parents also are really good athletes, and my father was a phenomenal soccer player. My mom was a really good track star, but we never knew it until we got older. So we're going to try our best to kind of keep it secret from our kids. But I don't know how good yeah, how easy I don't, that's going to be. I don't know if that's going to work. I don't know if that's going to work. And if they fall in love with sports, I'm hoping they do it on their own. Awesome, awesome. Mm -hmm. So I, I told you backstage I was going to make fun of you, but Sign is here promoting... Uh, not a book. She wrote two books at the same time. So I always say an Olympian. I can't even hold up both of them. <laughs> so she has two books that are out right now. One is Run With Me and Chasing Grace. Yes. So first of all, why two books? Did you just want to be like, I'm an Olympian, I got to write two? Or <laughs> what, what, what was the, uh, the plan behind that? Well, it's funny. When I, I originally wanted to write a book about five years ago, I wanted to write a teen book. That was my first passion. And then as I got older and my career ended, I thought, wow, it's kind of a perfect place now to write a memoir because I've had some tremendous life experiences that I really wanted to share. So Zondervan gave me an opportunity to write my adult book. And then they were like, you know, this is such a great project. Would you be interested in doing one for kids and for teens? I was like, absolutely. That was my first passion anyway. So my kids' book is out today as well. And my teen book comes out top of the year. So I wrote three books actually at once. <laughs> three books at once. <laughs> I don't know what to say to you. <laughs> Why are you such an underachiever, Sonia? <laughs> so three books. Yes, three books, but two available now. All right. Yeah. That kid has way too much pressure. <laughs> three books at once. So tell me, what is, is it the same ideas through all three of these books? Yeah. I know, um, so first of all, I had the amazing experience to actually see you run live yeah. uh, at the Olympics. Um, we were at the same Olympics together. Not, I'm a fencer, but. Yeah. Oh four, oh eight, and yeah. twelve. Yeah. I got a chance to see you. I think we're on a preliminary. Yeah. Um, TV does not do justice, <laughs> by the way, to how fast yeah. you guys run. Thank I you. I mean, it is incredible. You you cannot think a human can go as fast. Yeah. As when you see it live, it's just like awe inspiring. So Thank tell you. me a little about these books, and mm -hmm. I know you're you're looking to inspire. Yeah. Um, so what, what, what do you want people to take from these books? Well, first of all, um, like you said, I think for me, the f this book was inspired by the 400. And the 400 is the hardest sprint race on the track. It really challenges you mentally, physically, and spiritually. And I think because of that, and I did it for 13 years um, at the highest level, I learned a lot. And so I actually divide the book up um, into the four Ps, which is the strategy that I used for the 400. The four Ps are push, pace, position, poise, and then there's a secret fifth P, prayer, which is super ah. important to me. Um, and so my coach gave me the strategy, and as I got older, I realized kind of the genius in the strategy. So the push phase in the, four, in the 400 is the first 50 meters of the race, where you got to get out as fast as you can. You don't think about the rest of the race, you're just going full speed. And that's kind of how we attack life. You have this dream, you're excited about it, you're energized, and you go towards that dream. And then pace is the backstretch. This is the second 100 of the race where you have to find a rhythm. In the 400, if you try to go all out the whole way, you're not going to make it. And so you got to find a rhythm and routine. The same thing in life. You want to pace yourself. You don't want to burn out because you're so excited about this new passion that you don't get to the finish line. And then the third phase of the 400 is called position. And I think it's the most important part of the race and the most important part of life. And the positioning phase 
is where you got to have the courage to go for it. I got to throttle back up to full speed. I got to trust my training, trust myself that if I go for it now, I'm going to win this race. Just like life, where you got to start making tough choices. Am I going to move to LA for this job? Am I going to move to New York and become a host? You know, the stuff that really sets you up for success. And then the final phase is called poise. And this is where you just got to Trust, keep your eye on the finish line, believe in yourself, because in the 400, if you start to flail and doubt, you're going to lose. And so I use this strategy in the book to help you strategize life. I think we're all in some phase of that throughout our life. And like I say, prayer for me is super important. And you pray throughout the entire journey. We used to joke in the 400, the last 50, you want to pray because you feel like you're going to die. <laughs> Literally, but you know, really though, prayer has really been kind of my saving grace um, throughout my career and throughout my life. How much can, are you actually thinking when you're running like a race? Like, yeah. uh, is it one of those situations where it's like life's in slow motion, right? And even though it's seconds, it yeah. feels like a long time. Like, what are you th actually thinking when you're running a race? It's a really good question. The 400 is a thinker sprint. Like the other races, you don't really have much time to, to sprint, right? Like Usain Bolt's not thinking about anything in the 100. He's just By the like, way, I love Go. that she just talks trash about the other events. <laughs> if we have a 100-meter runner, are they going to say that's the hardest track event? Do you no, all just say that? No, they no. Would say, okay, they would say they the would, 400. That's okay, why they okay. don't run it. But uh -huh. um, <laughs> no, I'm not saying the 100 is not a difficult race, and it takes a lot of skill and speed. Yeah, we 100% agree, yeah. But when you think about physically taxing, the 400 is definitely the hardest of the, of the sprint races. And so in the 400, you do think during the race because you have to. You can't go out there and just run blindly or you're not going to execute well. So I do think about the four Ps throughout the entire race. And that's why it's kind of been ingrained in me and it was so impactful. And I actually dedicate this book to my coach because, you know, I would think about this in practice and on the track every time, like, okay, push. And then now relax, relax, breathe, you know. And, I, and so I would think about that as I was competing. How, you said in your book that the 400 meters chose you. Yes. So how is it that, like, what was it about the 400 meters right. versus the 100 meters, the other events right. that this was like your thing? Yeah, I say the 400 chose me because I started out as a short sprinter. I used to run the 100 and 200, which are the events I really, really liked. And my father, when I was 16, said, look, if you want to be great, you got to get stronger. You need to at least train for the 400 in order to become a better 100, 200 meter runner. So I said, okay, dad, I'll train for it. And I'm only going to run one, <laughs> one 400. <laughs> I go to the indoor nationals, actually here in New York at the Armory, break the national high school record at 400 meters, and I ended up staying there. So I always think, <laughs> I didn't choose the 400. It certainly chose me. <laughs> and you mentioned, so what are things we might not, that might not be obvious to us when we're running a race? Like, I'm always fascinated by the small details. Mm -hmm. Like, what are some things that separate you? Because I feel like there's... Um, at the highest levels, it becomes, like, really, really small things, like... Yeah arm technique yeah. or your thumb has to be in a certain position like <laughs> what, what are some things that are not let's say obvious about right um what you have to do like what's a small detail of being an olympic champion runner that someone might not think about good question tim i um well i i don't know if there's a small detail specifically to just running but i definitely think it's the small things that add up to success so i think for an elite athlete, like you know, it's um, it's the rest, it's eating well, it's drinking a lot of water, it's the prehab. Like I had a full-time physical therapist who traveled with me to keep my muscles loose and all those types of things. So, and I also think too, at the highest level, because everyone is usually just as talented, it's really the mental component that kind of takes you over the edge when you're on that line at the Olympic final with 90,000 people in the stands and millions of people watching back home. There's a huge mental component, I think, to success that allows for you to separate from the rest of the field. Can you tell when you're in a race that like this is going well or yes. <laughs> even depending like where you are, like do you know, like at what point do you know I'm winning this race? Is it yeah. even in the first few steps or? No, it's not the first few steps. It's usually in that third 100 in that positioning phase. Um, a lot of times for me, I kind of, the first 200 of the race is kind of easy because I'm a really fast runner. So usually that part was good. But then by the time I got into the third 100, if that kick wasn't there, if I wasn't moving away from people, I was like, this is not going to be a good day. Didn't happen often, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it did happen. So I know a lot of what you share in this book is very personal. Yes. Um, and I was wondering if you could share a little bit how, because you talked about every lesson you sort of learned in life, you feel like that quarter mile yeah. taught you how to deal with it. Maybe you could talk through you know, some of the challenges you face. But I always say what makes an Olympian, it's not the successful part. And I saw some other interviews talk about the same thing. It's, it's how you deal with 
the challenges and the difficult situations. Yeah. So how did track help you to deal with some of the situations? And if you're willing yeah. to talk about some of the things you do in your book, that'd be great. Sure. Um, well, there are a couple issues that I address in the book. One is body issues. Um, and I talk about a time in 2007 when I was diagnosed with a rare autoimmune disease. Um, and I started to have really bad lesions on my skin, mouth ulcers. Um, I had fatigue and joint pains. And it was the first time as, as an athlete, I never noticed that you know, I'm so fit and I never really paid attention to the perks that came with training every day. I just had, <laughs> you know, six pack abs and like <laughs> beautiful skin and, you know, and then for the first time in my life, I started to have real insecurities and I really could empathize um, and sympathize with a lot of people, not just women, men and women who really struggle with what is beauty. Um, and especially as a female athlete in the spotlight where we're wearing minimal clothes to compete I struggled for a while with that. Um, and then, and I'm so grateful that I had that experience because it really taught me about true beauty. I still love hair and makeup and all that, but it doesn't define me. And I was, during that time in my life, I was able to realize that true beauty does radiate from within. And when you're happy and when you nurture your soul and your spirit and you're doing the things that you love, those are the things that make you truly beautiful. And I think as an athlete who has learned how to persevere through ups and downs, that really helped me through that time of my life. And what are the keys to like, if you're going to give advice to someone who's facing a challenge right now, like what are, what are the, what were some of the advice, advice, advices? That's not a word. <laughs> what are some of the things you share with them? Um, you know, I think that for me, I also talk a lot about my family in the book. Um, and I just always had people around me who really loved and supported me. When you go through tough times, it's not easy. We all know that. That's why we call them tough times. And so when you have people who can encourage you and love on you, that really helps a lot. And I know everyone doesn't have a you know, great family, but there's always people around you that you can identify who help you and lift you up through those times. And then my faith, you know, I feel like everything happens for a reason. I feel like my gift came from God and I try to honor him with everything that I do so I really lean heavily on my faith and trusting that everything happens for a reason and I try to smile through the storms even though they're not easy um, but we all go through them and they build character. Has faith always been a big part of your life or is it yes. something that yeah. came later? Yeah faith has always been a huge part of my life. I talk about in the book I was saved when I was 13. Um, my aunt Maureen was the one who really exposed me to a Christian lifestyle and I remember just admiring her strength the joy, the peace that she had, even when I was a young girl and wanting to know where it came from because it didn't seem to matter the circumstances. She just always had a positive disposition. And so I learned, you know, that she just loved God and she just had this, this unconditional love in her heart. And so I wanted that for myself and I've been walking with Christ ever since. And how you talk in the book also about some of those tough decisions you had to you left from your longtime agent. I know it's yeah. one thing. Yeah. And you talk about the importance of people in your life. Yeah. In that situation, like what, how did you know you had to make that move? Yeah. And, and that must have been probably at the time seemed like a very maybe risky thing to do is what you knew. Yeah. Um, so I talk about my first agent who I worked with. And as an athlete, it's really tough when you're going into that phase of life because everybody wants to work with you and they tell you how great you are and all these things they can do for you. And, you know, and especially when you're young, I, I became a professional athlete when I was 18, um, signed with Nike when I was 18. And, you know, he comes in in a nice suit and, you know, just looks perfect. Um, and then you realize, especially for me, as I was going through the season, that he wasn't meeting my expectations. He wasn't supporting me the way I wanted him to. And, um, and yeah, it was tough because everyone else in my, in my life, all of my coaches, managers, I've worked with them for over 10 to 13 years. So relationships matter to me. I, I love on people and I want, I want it to be successful. So it was really hard when someone who I admired, he was a world record holder in the 100 hurdles, Ronaldo Nehemiah, a great guy. But, you know, I just felt like he wasn't serving me. And, you know, and so I, I write about in the book, especially for young people, young athletes who are going through it, you know, that... It might be hard, but I'm so happy I did it because I ended up working with my parents who I couldn't be, I couldn't have had people in my corner who loved and supported me more. They ended up being my agents. But, you know, sometimes people will take advantage and sometimes people don't meet your expectations and it's okay uh, to move on from that. I want to talk about the Olympics. So now um, 
I know you retired. Yeah. You definitely retired, or is, yeah. there a, is there a comeback in you? No comeback no in Tokyo? me. No Tokyo? No, no, no Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> you, I'll you're be gonna, there. By the way, I think you'll get that question I know, for the next 40 the years. I will I be see. there with NBC <laughs> compensating, hopefully, but I will not be competing. <laughs> I've seen people ask Carl Lewis if he was coming I, back. Oh, my it's God. It's like, the guy is like 50. I don't think he can come back anymore. <laughs> exactly. You look like you can come back, though. <laughs> Thank you. You look like you're ready to go. Thank you. What Now, looking back on the Olympics, are there things that maybe you appreciate more now that you didn't then? What, what are some of the things that, when you reflect on that experience, yeah. um, stand, sort of stands out for you? Yeah, you know, Tim, I think for the most part, I was always in the moment. And so I don't think there was anything I didn't appreciate. But the parts I love the most, the parts that people don't get to see, and you know this too, like for me, the best day of the Olympics are the first day that we walk into the Olympic Village. And they're athletes from all over the world. And there's this feeling of just love and hope. And it's like a utopia. It's literally like utopia. Like you wish you could experience it every single day because, you know, no one has been disappointed yet. Everyone thinks we're going to win the gold medal. <laughs> we all think we're going to be gold medalists. Everyone's still happy. Yeah, everyone's still so happy. Everyone has worked so hard to get there. We're all representing our country. That's my favorite part of the Olympics is the first day you walk in and you see everyone. And then, of course, opening ceremonies and all those things just kind of make it, you know, more and more sweet. Um, but, yeah, you know, I, I, I cherish all of those memories, and I'm so happy I had them, you know. And I tell people all the time, like, oh, you, you, are you sad you retired? No, because the best parts of the sports are still with me, you know. And the medals are great, and I always, you know, strived for that. But the relationships and the memories, like, that's what, that's what it really is. Any, any least favorite parts of the Olympics? Losing. Losing. <laughs> when you're unhappy after, yeah, yeah, after yeah, a loss. When you're disappointed. That's the, the worst part of the Olympics. But otherwise, it's all good. I would say the Olympic Village is truly fascinating. Yeah. We always like to play a game like, what guess the sport? Because mm -hmm. it really oh. is. When you think like body, the, the Olympic <laughs> Village, it's right. really all shapes, all shapes and sizes. Right. So we're always playing like, I wonder, it's like six yeah. foot seven women yeah. and then like four foot tall. I mean, it's like everything. Every is there. type is represented. That's so true. So you're always trying to fit the volleyball players. Right. There. <laughs> Biggest shoulders. <laughs> um, talk a little about, so in Beijing, I know you had kind of a challenge with the race. How, how did you use that to motivate you towards London? Yeah, Beijing was a really, really tough experience for me. And I share a really personal story in the book. I don't know if I should share it now or if you can I share, You can share it. Should I, should <laughs> if I you share want, it? only if you want, obviously. Yeah. Okay, I do want to. Okay, <laughs> but if I get emotional, okay, so um, I already feel myself going there. Lord help. Okay. Um, in 2008, before um, I left for Beijing, a month before I left, I found out I was pregnant. And um, I was dating my, hus you know, my husband at the time. We were engaged. But, um, you know, I didn't want to have a child at that time. Um, and it was really hard for me because as a Christian woman who really tries to honor God, I never thought I'd be in that position. And so I had an abortion the day before I got on the plane to Beijing. And it was by far the toughest time of my life. Um, for the first time in my life, I felt like, I wasn't just outrunning my competition on the track. I was outrunning the shame, this unworthiness, this heaviness that I was carrying um, that, you know, was so foreign to me. And so in Beijing, I was favored to win gold, and I won the bronze. And, um, you know, in some weird way, I felt like it was that I, I just felt like I didn't deserve to ask God for my biggest blessing when I had done something that just didn't fit well with my soul. And so that very same night, I... Um, and the reason I shared in the book is because the book is called Chasing Grace. And, you know, I feel like I would have been disingenuous to my story if I didn't share the moment when I felt God's grace the most. And so that night, as I was boarding a bus to go be with my family, I just broke down. I was bawling on the back of the bus. I actually got off the bus because I couldn't even see where I was going. And I literally felt God wrap his arms around me and tell me that he loved me. And um, I felt forgiven in that moment. Um, and so for me, um, even though I had to learn to forgive myself and get past it, it was by far the best experience I ever had with, with God because I realized nothing can separate us from the love of God. And even though that experience was meant to keep me down and despondent, um, instead I feel like I was able to overcome. And I thank God I was never in that situation again. But it was definitely a great teaching moment for me. And, um, and then I came back in 2012, and I was able to win gold in the 400. And so it was just, and now I feel like God restores. I'm having a baby now. So it's like what an awesome time to tell my story and hopefully help other women who are in the same situation who, 
you don't realize how much it hurts until you actually start talking about it. You know, a big part of still being in that prison is that you don't share it. And so you have that shame. So <sighs> heavy, but, yeah. you know, a big part of my story. What, what made you decide that you wanted to share the story at this point? Was it yeah. something that was an easy decision, difficult? Oh, no. I mean, did your... I'm sure your husband, when you guys were sitting down to decide, like, is yeah. this something we want to include? Like, yeah. what ultimately led you to want to share the story? Well, I think for me it was because I really wanted to do something that honored God. And I think sometimes we try to pretend like we're perfect and the journey is easy. And then I think it's a little bit off-putting for people. And so, you know, it. I literally, my publishers, nobody knew about this story. This got in, like, the ninth hour in my book because I was prayerful for over a year. Like, God, should I share this story? Will it help people? I don't know how people will receive it, but it wasn't about that. It was really about honoring God and, um, and sharing a time in my life that was really a tough spiritual journey for me. So my husband supported me um, 100%, but like I said, it was kind of like a last-minute decision, but I just kind of trusted God with it. Yeah, and I know it always seems, I mean, you talk about this also, but on the outside, everything's perfect, yeah. everything's amazing. I feel like people don't always share when they're struggling, Yeah, and I think... Because you shared that story, I think you're going to reach that many more people I hope be able so. to help them. Because yeah. people, I always find like when I struggle, you assume no one else is. And that's yeah. when, pe you know, the, the least, the person you least expect that comes up to you is like, you know, hey, actually, been we, we've been there. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think I think it's going to speak to a lot of people. And I, I think so. obviously very brave of you to, to you. share that story. I know it's not something that people want to necessarily touch as a topic. I know you're even like, should I even bring it up while right. we're talking? But no, I think it's right. I think it's really powerful that you're willing to share and be open. And I think, you know, that at the end of the day, it's going to reach a lot of people. So Thank you. I think Thanks this so book is a, is a fantastic book. Thank we want to um, get some audience questions awesome. as well. And yeah, uh, so on that very light note, um, <laughs> you're up. <laughs> Hi. That was just a powerful moment, and I'm sure over your career you have this long-reaching career and so many moments like that, so I was wondering how you even began to hone your focus for a book like this. <laughs> Thank you um, for the question, first of all, and you know, I'm so happy that I waited until retirement to write my book because it really did take the kind of intensity and focus it takes to train for the Olympics. And, you know, had I written it before, I don't think I would have been as thoughtful. I don't think I would have been as open. And so it's, and I remember when I met with the publisher, they were like, oh, it's going to take you about a year, year and a half. I'm like, Psh, I'm a sprinter. <laughs> I was like, I'm getting that thing done in no time. And um, no, she was absolutely right. It took every bit of that year to, um, to write this book. And, um, um, and yeah, I'm really excited because I feel like I've closed one chapter of my life with track and field. And so to be able to go back and have that hindsight and to connect the dots and see where the lessons really led me to the top of the podium, you know, I'm really grateful to be able to do that now. By the way, anytime I have an Olympian on who's promoting a book moving forward, I'm going to just tell them that you wrote three books. So. <laughs> I'm just going to use that to make them feel bad. Yes, go ahead. Hi, Sonia. Congrats Hi. on the literary hat trick. Thank uh -huh. you. <laughs> I like that I'm yeah. using that. I had, to use sports, <laughs> I had to do a sports reference. But um, so I'm curious, you know, if you were to do one more 400, mm -hmm. who would your dream competitors be, male or female? Oh, that's such a good question. If I were to run my final 400, who would I want to line up beside me? They wouldn't want to be in a race, but. <laughs> um, well, you know, so Wade Van Niekerk from South Africa just broke the war record in the 400, and it was phenomenal to watch him run. I would love to race him. He'd have to give me like about a 60 meter head start, <laughs> but that would be great. Um, there's a woman from the Bahamas, Shawnee Miller, who is showing tremendous potential in the 400. I would love to line up against her. And I just have some old favorites, you know, like Noveline Williams, Natasha Hastings, Dee Dee Trotter, who I would love to line up some of my US teammates. So it's a really good question, but I don't want to line up for the 400 again. <laughs> <laughs> But it was nice to go down memory lane. Thank you. If you, if you need a slow old fencer, I, I can, I'll join your. I I'll think you could beat me track. right now yeah. too. <laughs> I, I actually doubt it. Even if we ran in heels, uh, I think you'd get and it. And seven months. At seven months, I've seen you run. I have a feeling you would still, you would still be outpacing me. Um, but thank you so much for coming on. Let's hold up your books right now. Yay. You got to get these. Chasing Grace. Run With Me. What's the third one called? Um, run With Me and then Right On Track. Run With Me is for 8 to 12-year-olds. So that one's for kids. This one's the adult one. Of course, that one doesn't have the story I just shared with you guys. That one is a real easy read, very educational and fun. And then this one is like adult content. Yes. Don't give it to an 8-year-old. Don't give it to the 8-year-olds, please. <laughs> Don't give it to an 8-year-old. Sonia Richard Ross, four-time Olympic gold medalist. Get her book. Thank you so much. And 
in two months, three months, we're going to have some uh, amazing news. So best of luck to you. Thank you. We look so forward much. to meeting your son at some point. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>